Alright. This is a morning stream. We don't get a lot of these. Just getting the stream announcements out. Guess we're safe to go. So, fair and keep first, I suppose. I don't really expect anybody to show up today, but I just wanted to have a nice stream. Jeez, I'm still tired. Something's like... Okay. Yeah, I'm really tired. It was up until like 2 last night. And this new fucking game called Iron Sight. It's weird. Yeah, so my friends and I installed this game called Iron Sight, and we were kind of just planning to play it to make fun of it, but it's actually, like, a really enjoyable Call of Duty clone. Like, back in the glory days of Modern Warfare 2 kind of Call of Duty clone. It's really surprisingly good. It's like, and it's obviously a Modern Warfare 2 clone. It's like, it's got kill streaks and perks and all that other fun, good stuff, but it's like, despite all that, like, or maybe not despite all that, more like because it follows the Call of Duty formula, but in a very unique way as a free to play multiplayer shooter. It seems pretty good. I hope, I hope that it revises their, they revise their business model a little bit. I'm hoping they revise their business model slightly. And I'm hoping... Yeah, revise their business model. And hope above hope, uh, they improve certain aspects of the game that are problematic while maintaining the parts that people really enjoy. I just hope it doesn't go down like uh, Blacklight Retribution did. It's like, it really sucks seeing, like, decent ideas go downhill because of, like, lame business practices or, like, stale gameplay. Gotta innovate. Keep it fresh. 
Okay. So. I don't remember that I'm at six minutes. Something I wanted to talk about. And I actually wrote, like, an article for this. But I don't actually think I'm going to... I was planning to do a video essay on it. But I think instead of that... I'm just going to talk about it now on stream, even though there's nobody here. Because I'll probably break this up into a highlight and upload it, because it's something I really wanted to talk about. So, a couple days ago, Sunday, I watched the first episode of Tokyo Ghoul Re. And I haven't talked about it a whole lot, but I really, really like... Tokyo Ghoul, and I like the latter half of Tokyo Ghoul Radical A. The first half was hit or miss, but I really like the latter half of Tokyo Ghoul Radical A. And now I'm seeing Tokyo Ghoul... Now I'm looking at Tokyo Ghoul Re. Um, I remember on Sunday, sitting alone in the cafeteria with my music on, and I just thought to myself, what the fuck happened? Tokyo Ghoul Re is a very strange case of forgotten identity. It's like Tokyo Ghoul Re seems to have com uh, seems to have completely forgotten the identity of the original series it came from, which I guess can make sense considering it's been. Uh, three years? Yeah, three years since the original series, or since Radical A ended. Radical A was in 2015, and now... Yeah, Radical A was in 2015, and now you got Re coming out this year in 2018. But, I mean, even with that, there are grievances that I'd really like to talk about that just have been on my mind. So, first of all, there's a weird art style shift now that I'm not sure I enjoy. The originally very grounded and simplistic character designs have more or less, like by and large, been replaced by these very outlandish, larger-than-life wackos that comprise... And this is going to be heavy spoiler territory, so, you know, if you intend to, like watch Tokyo Ghoul more than before you... If you intend to watch it and have not seen it already, then you should go. That's all I'm saying. Um, God, I'm tired. I'm speaking very ineloquently, but I'm doing my best. So... After... Or now that you know these, the the very grounded and simplistic character designs have been replaced by these very larger than life wackos that make up in Tokyo Ghoul Re what is called the Quinks Squad, which are basically, you know, ghoul human hybrids that are employed by the CCG, the Doves, to eliminate other ghouls. Which, I mean, first of all, I don't understand why the, why the CCG would feel any need to do that, because they were winning. At the end of Tokyo Ghoul Radical A, it was pretty well established that they're, they're winning. They don't, they don't need the help of other ghouls, they're doing just fine not by themselves. You know, you've got all these characters that they showed off that we had not previously seen who are, like, just as strong, if not stronger, as Kotaro Amon. And Kotaro Amon himself was able to take on Kaneki. Just like, you know. And so it's like... It kind of is interesting because you really feel like... You know, employing the ghouls... Employing ghouls defeats the purpose of the CCG, because once... Once the ghouls are eliminated from Tokyo, 
then what? You can't keep the Quink Squad. You can't reintroduce them to society because they are also ghouls. So that's like a big plot flaw. Also, along that same line, the Quink Squad are seen eating regular food at one point. Which really threw me off. So either the way they have been genetically modified permits them to eat real food, or the writers completely forgot that ghoul-human hybrids are still, in essence, ghouls and cannot consume normal food. So... That definitely was something that really took took my immersion away, and by and large, it, the show almost feels like it's grown bored of itself, in a way. Like, it's starting to hit on these really generic, like, battle anime beats. Like, and, well, you know, gen battle animes are never a bad thing. At least not for me. They do these things, like, um, at one point during a fight scene, there's, like, a JoJo-esque still frame. And it really throws me off, because it's like... That's not the kind of thing I associate with Tokyo Ghoul. Like, you see one of the characters do this, like, weird, like, you know, yelling in the still frame while there's an animated background, and it's like, yeah, I expect that from a lot of other battle animes, but Tokyo Ghoul is more akin to a classic, like, opera anime. It's not a battle anime. Not At least not as far as I'm concerned. Like, yes, there was fighting and the fight scenes traditionally have been pretty decently animated, but it's not it's not a fight anime. At least as far as I'm concerned. And... You know, you get these, like... The tone has completely shifted, too. It's like... Tokyo Ghoul and Tokyo Ghoul Radical A is very somber, very emotional, and very, like, hardened and down-to-earth. But in Tokyo Ghoul Re, I'm sort of getting this, like... Again, this vibe of, like, a classic anime where they use, you know, comic relief fairly frequently. You know, they use frequent comic relief. They have... Just, it's a lot of... It's a lot of things happening, but a lot of... But a lot less emotion being put into the events. And, uh, so, you know, we've got Tokyo Ghoul, which is traditionally a very dramatic, operatic anime, which is really its strongest suit, its strongest point. Like, its, its strength was in how emotional and dramatic it was overall particularly with the characters' struggles and how you can empathize with them despite the fact that they're basically superhuman cannibals.
and it's, you know, it was this very human show about, you know, the complex relationship between both the characters on both sides and the complex relationship that Kaneki has with the humans and the ghouls both because of his interesting, because of his, like, bizarre nature and, like, his experience in both, in both worlds. And so it was this character drama about the complexity of the relationships between all of the characters and the factions. Because obviously there were, you know, there are good people among the ghouls and there are good people among the CCG. And, you know, we see this in Kaneki's relationship with both... Um, I can't believe I forgot her name. Toka. You see this in Kaneki's relationship with Toka, you know, who... And most of the people from Anteku who are, in essence, just trying to live a normal life. And then you also see characters like Kotaro Amon, oh, yes. who are very zealous, but ultimately he is a... he's a good person, but he's, you know, he's grown this, like... Patho I mean, it's, I guess it's not really pathological, but he's he's grown to despise ghouls because of their nature as cannibals, which is understandable. Actually, and so you get this really interesting character dynamic between Kaneki, who is, in fact, a ghoul, but hates the fact that he needs to consume other, you know, other humans or ghouls to survive. And... So it puts him at odds with Kotaro Amon, despite the fact that really Amon himself is a very good person who's just trying to do what he believes is best. And all of that, like, unique character complexity feels lost in Tokyo Ghoul Re. Because, big spoiler, big spoiler drop here, you have Kaneki who's, for some reason, now an amnesiac, who's assumed the new identity of a CCG operative. He's the captain of the uh, CCG extermination squad now, so he's basically unknowingly switched teams. And... All of his previous character depth has fled him. Like, because he's not Kaneki anymore, by all intents and purposes. He's... Whatever this new character's name is, he's that guy. And it's like... That's a really jarring character shift, because... The Kaneki that we've grown to appreciate... Is now more or less gone, and... Yeah, I don't know, like, because I haven't read the manga, but... I don't know when we'll get him back again, if at all. We briefly see Kaneki's original consciousness in the first episode, but the new character, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting his name, he's like, no, I don't want you here, get out of my head. And he, you know, he does that whole shtick of like, get out of my head. And... Mm, I don't know. That's another one of the big problems I just wanted to mention is like, you have Tokyo Ghoul, you know, and it's been built up over two seasons with Tokyo Ghoul and Tokyo Ghoul Radical A, and it's been built up over two seasons as this really big, you know, intricate world with a lot of characters that we grow to love and appreciate. And then Tokyo Ghoul Re comes in and it basically hits the hard reset button. And now, like, we briefly see Akira Mado and we see uh, Hinami briefly. But, I mean, they're not interacting with characters we're familiar with. 
Hinami is talking with the new cast of characters who are instantly dislikable because they are selfish, arrogant, rude, and basically possess very unlikable traits. And but you know, you know that of course they're gonna undergo a very generic, like stock standard teamwork, like like they're gonna go undergo a very generic stock standard teamwork character arc where it's like, you know, cause with their characters they're like, oh, well I'm trying to be the best, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the biggest promotion of them all. I'm gonna be the best CCG operative, and I'm gonna. You know, and it's like one of those things where it's like the the kiss asses. Everybody except um, everybody except Kaneki's like new character, whatever his name is, is they're all they're all a bunch of kiss asses who are just trying to like get the biggest promotion so they can get like a big career in the CCG. And you know they're just gonna undergo the very stock standard anime teamwork character arc. And it's just to my great disappointment that they decided to go that route. But you see Hinami interacting with these characters, but it's so briefly, and all it's about is she says, well, I'm lo I want... I want an article of your boss's clothing, because their boss is Kaneki, and she has a relationship with Kaneki. However, like as I've said before, Kaneki is no longer... For all intents and purposes, Kaneki is no longer present in the story because of the fact that he's an amnesiac now. So, it leaves us in a rather strange position, all things considered. And again, we see Akita Mado interacting with Kaneki's new character. But again, it's not Mado interacting with anybody we've necessarily seen before. So, for in essence, all of the major characters have been banished from the story. And for an indefinite amount of time, because like I said, I don't know... I haven't read the manga, so I don't know if and when we'll see them again. But for an indefinite amount of time, we're not going to see a bunch of the characters we grew to be familiar with. And that's of great concern to me. Because, you know... You spend all this time getting invested. You spend all this time getting invested in all these characters, and then suddenly it says, two years later, with a bunch of characters you don't care about, and it really throws you for a loop, because it says, well, what happened? Bring back the... Because you just want to say, well, what happened? Bring back the characters... Bring back the characters I was familiar with. What the fuck? Especially because, you know, you look at it, and it's like, the end of Radical A was such a powerful moment for the series. And particularly, it, you know, it was a very rough emotional episode, it was a very rough emotional finale, and it was very well delivered, well executed, and it was like... You have this ending that builds up such a heavy expectation for what's to come next, if anything. And then what comes next is such an underwhelming thing, because instead of following on from the events directly proceeding such a... such a heavy moment, alternatively, you choose instead to skip ahead two years to a character that, yes, is in essence the main character but at the same time is not for most intents and purposes and yeah it just it feels so largely unconnected and that's what's got me so worried is you've got this series that seems to have forgotten its own identity with how it 
the tone and the action and everything. You've got the series that has lost such a big semblance of its identity and all these things, like, you know, the tone, the action, all these things, that now feel very standard as far as anime is concerned, which segues to the next thing. The series also feels so exhausted with itself. It doesn't feel like it wants to keep telling its story, even though it's still going. And that just kind of, you know, segues to this whole thing of, well, how am I going to stay invested? And you've got a story that doesn't want to keep telling itself, and indeed has no reason to keep telling itself, now that it's really, like, straining to keep me invested. Like, you know, I'm out here and I want to see, like, I'm trying to think. I want to see what happened to everybody, like, because at the end of Radical A, we're left being very uncertain as to the fate of Hide, the fate of Amon. We're left very uncertain about so many characters. And I just don't know how Tokyo Ghoul Re is going to pan out from here. And depending on how things go, I might segue over to the manga just to see how it turns out because... Hello. Because I've got a friend who's read it. Yep, that's what I'm talking about. I've got a friend who's read it who says that it's a lot better overall. Yeah, and... Yeah, because I watched the first episode of Re, and I'm feeling very let down. And I, I I went on a big thing about this. It's been like 20 minutes since I started talking about this, but you know, it's the fact that like none of the like we, you know we see a lot of the major characters have disappeared from the plot for an un indefinite amount of time, and it just leaves me confused and wondering when I'll even see that see them again and if I'm going to stay invested in the series long enough to really care when they come back because like <laughs> yeah well I I enjoyed the animation because the acting was also like solid top notch shit like, in both the Japanese and English versions, because I watched... I watched Tokyo Ghoul Original, the 2014 season, in English, and then I watched Radical A in uh, subs. And I liked... I liked both the English and Japanese actors. And so I'm... I don't know. I just... I guess to finish what I was saying so I can just kind of get back to the stream at large, is that Tokyo Ghoul Re has put the series, the animation at least, into a very... into a very precarious situation of suspending its audience just beyond the point of caring. And I'm not sure if the series fully understands how it's going to bring its audience back after pushing all of these characters to the sideline. As like I said, we see Hinami and we see Akira Mado, but we don't 
see them interacting with characters in any meaningful way. I don't know. I'll keep watching just because I am for the time being still invested. Yeah. I'll keep watching because for the time being I'm still invested, but I am at this point definitely going to read the manga just to understand what I'm missing. Yeah, a JoJo level adaptation, it is not. I guess the part that just disappoints me most is like... ...re-followed on from Radical A in such an underwhelming way. Especially because Radical A had a really good ending. <laughs> the original interactions are not resolved, but at a good stopping point for the original base cast. Yeah. Again, I also, I'm just, I don't like the new characters. I think their art design is too outlandish, and I think they're just total shitheads. I don't think they're very interesting. And they they feel like, you know, like I said, they're just vying for the promotion. It's like they're the generic kiss-ass characters. I'd reckon they get better. I mean, it is, it is for all intents and purposes a new series, but I'm just not sure how far I can suspend my impatience now. That's, that's my main thing is I'm at this point getting very, at this point, I was ready for Re. Like, when I finished Radical A, I was like, oh man, I wonder how they're going to follow on from this. And then we get to Re, and now I'm just feeling very impatient. Thanks for dropping by the stream, by the way. Very nice having this little chate. It's good to hear from somebody who's got more experience with the series, because my experience right now is limited to how far the anime has gone.
No, yeah, I really like it a lot. I love, like, because it's, it's a very grim character drama, and I really enjoy that about the series, that it's very somber, and it tells a very, you know, dark but very human story. Well, very then hey. And, you know, the only reason I'm being so critical of Re is not because I want to dislike it, but because I really want to enjoy it, but it's doing so much wrong right now. Audio coming through fine, by the way. I'm just trying to make sure, like, I'm not getting any mic pops, and my voice coming is coming through at an appropriate volume. Can you, uh, can you enunciate on that a little bit? I'm a little bit, like, the anime is done odd because where the first and second seasons are, doesn't cover all the first manga. Oh yeah, I knew that. I heard, yeah, I heard that Tokyo Ghoul, because I, I know that, because my friend who also read it, he said that Tokyo Ghoul ends where Tokyo Ghoul Radical A ends. Kind of like a Naruto versus Naruto Shippuden sort of thing. So anyway, I'm planning to um, upload like the last 20 minutes or so up to YouTube as its own thing, just because I meant to like give a video essay about Tokyo Ghoul, but honestly, like video essays, like writing out a whole script isn't my style. I'm very much more of an ad lib kind of person, so this is this has been a lot better for me. Speaking of other anime, though, so Dragon Ball Super's finally over. Wonder what they're gonna do with the movie that's coming out uh, later this year. Jumped off the Dragon Ball train.
Why is that? Yeah, my brother and I remember experiencing a similar feeling, but we finished watching it anyways just for the fights. See, the funny part is, though, is that the Ultra Instinct is probably one of the most interesting things. Ultra Instinct is probably one of the most interesting things to happen to Dragon Ball. Because it's not just another generic transformation, because in Ultra Instinct, Goku is completely normal. So it's like... That's one of the more interesting... I was really getting fucking sick of the Super Saiyan transformation, so to have Goku in basically a normal phase, like for once, is really a lot better in my opinion. I forgot to grab a torch, I'm gonna need a torch for this. Like, after having watched it, I really have to say that Ultra Instinct is probably one of the better things that happened to the series, just because it was finally a, like a, a break from another fucking Saiyan transformation. No, yeah, that's like, that's kind of what my, the same feeling my brother had. My brother said, they really need to stop with these transformations because you really can't get any more powerful. Like, with the way the characters have gone, they're so, like, goddamn perfect at everything that it's like, you really, literally cannot make a more powerful character. And they shouldn't try to. And I agree with that sentiment a lot. I think that the power scaling in the show got absolutely ridiculous. But I do respect a lot of the characters they introduced, and that's part of the reason I enjoy Super, is because I enjoyed characters like Beerus and Hit. And that's why I'm still grateful for its existence, even if it's not great. Okay, I just want to target this dude. <sighs> no, yeah, that's understandable. I mean, you know, not every show is for everybody, and, you know, you don't have to be particularly interested in Dragon Ball. Nobody said you had to be. 
I understand why anybody would dislike Dragon Ball. 100%. Dragon Ball is a very one-dimensional series that it pretty much revolves around, like, fighting and the unique abilities of the characters, but that's about it. So, if it's not your bag, I totally get it. Yeah, um... Shit, what am I even planning to watch? After this. Um, well, I've been keeping up on... Or I've been trying to keep up on Overlord. I'm, like, weeks and weeks behind. I'm pretty sure the season is done now, but... What series? Dark Souls, you mean? Ah, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Same. I've... Yeah. I'm on, uh, Vadi Video's Patreon server. It's like one of those things. It's like... The lore is something I can easily digest and get invested in, because it's like, you know, you got all these really, you know big characters that you never see, but you read about them and you kind of just compile information from reading about them. It's interesting. Ooh, I'm not gonna get that counter hit, am I? Nope. Yeah, until Dark Souls 3 kind of defeated that premise by being like, well, actually, you can do stuff. I like, um... I like what Dark Souls 2's secret ending did with it, because Dark Souls 2's secret ending was basically the only person you can really help is yourself. You can't save humanity from the curse, but you can save yourself. Yeah. Yeah, what you do doesn't really nece what you do doesn't necessarily change anything to the world at large because the world at large is what it is. Yeah, more or less. 
As you can see, obviously, I've been playing for a long time, so I kind of just have the roots memorized. I'm a, yeah, but I'm a big longtime fan of this series. Been playing since Prepare to Die hit PC in 2013. Ah, those those minimal hyper armor frames on this hammer have actually saved me so many times. It's great. It's always weird. He never actually falls off the world map when I hit him with it. Yeah, I'm pretty excited for the remaster, even though, uh, I'm excited, but I'm also kind of disappointed about the remaster, since the remaster has no actual, like, visual improvements in the textures or animation. It's, I don't know. It's a bit upsetting, I have to say. Like, the textures are basically just, like, straight up ported from Dark Souls 1 with some, like, resolution upgrades. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling myself rather disappointed that they didn't paint new textures. Like, yeah, they have new, new, like, visual effects for things like fog walls and lightning, but I was expecting, like... A legitimate market visual improvement. I'm glad they're keeping the mechanics the same because, like, 
ultimately what I really want is just preservation of the integrity of the original game. But I was hoping that it would be like a legitimate like remaster with like better textures and everything. I was expecting them to put in the same level of effort that Bungie put in for Halo Anniversary. That's what I was expecting. Still, as long as I get to have Dark Souls 1 on PS4, I'm happy. Probably never, they're probably never going to port Demon Souls at this point, though, which is a shame. It would be a lot of fun to play Demon Souls on the PS4. Yeah, it's a bit. it was a bit much to hope for, but it seemed like it'd be a lot of fun. I've never played Demon Souls, and... The only person I know who has a PS3 is my dad, and I don't see him a whole lot. No, no, yeah, Dark Souls is definitely done. No, for sure. But I'm just saying. And I've kind of had this conversation with people before, is I'm glad Miyazaki, in his infinite wisdom, decided to cut it off where it is. Because honestly, like, you should strive for innovation, not iteration. Like, doing the same thing over and over again is not like it makes you money but it's not conducive to very strong artistic integrity which is what what's more important to Miyazaki which I really appreciate Because, you know, like, if you start iterating, you become the next Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed. You're just another game pushing sequels year in, year out.
I'll probably just like buy my dad demon souls at some point under the guise of saying Bloodborne 2 is probably not gonna happen. I hope it doesn't. Honestly, I, I hope that From actually decides to make a new IP. Shadows Die Twice might... I, I've, I, I've guessed this before, but Shadows Die Twice might be Bloodborne 2, possibly, just because, you know, Shadows might be referring to the Shadows of Yarnum, and then Die Twice might be referring to, you know, like, 2, like, Bloodborne 2. But, in all fairness, I really hope it's a new IP. Because I want to see From branch out and do more stuff. It's like, they've already made so many good action RPGs, both with Armored Core and the Soulsborne series. So, you know, it's just like, I wonder what more they can do. But, like, Mecha and Dark Fantasy are the... Mecha and Dark Fantasy are the only things that From has done. And I want to see them do more than just Mecha and Dark Fantasy. What's an amazing name? Armored Core? Oh yeah, Shadows Die Twice. That's the name of their upcoming project. Because it's a working title, we don't know if that's actually going to be the name. Or if it's just like, ooh, maybe we're, maybe we're teasing something else, I don't know. Because up until Bloodborne came out, the teased, or up until Bloodborne had an official title, the project name was Project Beast. So, we don't know if Shadows Die Twice is going to be the official name of the game, or if it's just a working title. Oh shit, that hurts. Stop it. Yeah, I'm... I mean, the funny thing is that the only thing about Shadows Die Twice that we know is, like, what we saw from the teaser, which is literally nothing. So, it's kind of hard to say whether or not it's uh, an IP they've worked on before, or if it's something brand new. Again, I'm praying that it's something brand new. Because I'm looking for innovation, not iteration.
same. That's a mood right there. I. Uh... Skirt. Gonna have a lot of souls after this one. This weapon is way better than it has. That camera, that camera angle almost killed me. This weapon has is way better than it has any right to be. Why is the blacksmith hammer so freaking good? I should have crossed the fucking Joe with it. Patches is the best character. Changed my mind. All right, I'm going to warp to the main bonfire, and I will be right back. Got to use the bathroom. Sorry about that.
of the forlorn who have no place to call their own. Please bear witness to our resolve. Fire for Ariandel. Fire for Ariandel. And the ash to kindle flame. <gasps> And I'm back. I did not take very long. Now we get in the move on. Why it's so damn cold in here? What I'm really glad about, though, about Dark Souls Remastered is that it's just 1080p 60fps on a PlayStation 4. Honestly, like, the lack of visual enhancements is a disappointment, but I think my disappointment is outweighed by my relief that I just get to play a 1080p 60fps Dark Souls 1 on PS4. drink here. for this fight's really good. This is like, the Dark Souls 3 soundtrack doesn't reach me the same way the Dark Souls 1 and 2 soundtracks do, but this one still has its bangers for sure. Like, this song right here is just like one of the biggest bangers in the whole soundtrack. Just like their Dark Souls 3 has one is like one of those soundtracks where like I think a lot about a majority of I think a lot about the entire soundtrack of Dark Souls 1 and a lot of Dark Souls 2's soundtrack. But Dark Souls 3 is one of those soundtracks where either this like I get a song that I like or I don't, and it's like a 50-50 split of songs that reach me and songs that are just like, yeah, it's alright, I guess. Because Motoi Sakuraba didn't work on a lot of this soundtrack. Like he did a few songs. He did um he did Nameless King. I don't want to sell that. But like Motoi Sakuraba is like one of those composers for me that like his if like if his you know if it's his work I'm probably going to enjoy it.
works very deadly. Right then, moving on. We're just banging through these. Moving right along. You know what I've been wanting to rewatch lately? I've really been wanting to rewatch Standalone Complex. I need to go back to the shrine. I missed something. We have with another old token. Oh. Old token. There we go. Pointless Titanite shard since I already have my um, my hammer upgraded past its shard capacity. Good weapon. 10 out of 10. 
Good hammer for smashing scootals. You got skeletons in your basement? You need you need a hammer, that's what you need. Got, got some skeletons laying around? You, you just, just get a hammer, you break those bones. Smash the bones up. I love that even though Dark Souls is probably one of the most unique fantasy games I've ever played, they're still not above skeletons. Wow, I really make short work of those guys with this. Just knock them straight down with a hammer. Proof that impact weapons have and always will be the best freaking weapons in Dark Souls. There we go. Oh yeah, of course, rats. You're not a dark fantasy unless you have rats and skeletons somewhere. He ain't nowhere. I ain't see him. I ain't see shit. Um, got four shards. Uh, I'll just upgrade. Uh, next next time I get to uh, Fire Link, which will probably be after the boss. This boss does not require a very strong weapon. Whew. That was kind of scary. I was about to fucking bite it. That spot's always a little difficult without a shield because you gotta wait there. Luckily, Perseverance is on my side. Uh oh. Oof! Ow, oof, ouch, my bones. Classic Dark Pursuers.
Sorry, I'm a little quiet now. I don't really have much else to talk about at the moment. At least no nothing that I can think of. Oh boy, okay. The, um... Night Slayer Sorig. Right, okay. Okay, this... I might die, might not, we'll see. Alright. Okay. I was way more worried about that fight than I had to be. Smash those bones up. Lots of large shards now. That's quite lovely. There it goes. Oh my god, fucking auto target. Also, that's a good feeling when you stretch and like everything pops. That's a great fucking, that's a great feeling. What's not a great feeling is when the camera betrays you and makes you rotate around and fall into the, fall into the pit. Ah, Dark Souls, where the only thing that can really kill me is the camera.
be gone, thought. Take that, spooky skeletons. I see that one coming. Vape Nash out here, fam. Another one done. It's burning through these. My goodness.
get a uh, boneless dancer of despair Probably get up to, um, I think there's some chunks here, so I could probably get up to like plus seven or something at this point. Big Avalon. I was trying to time that with the sound, with the time I heard it launch, because I thought I heard it. mistimed it slightly.
item box, s store everything that I'm not using. Ooh, hang on, wait a minute. Bring that back. Give me that. I might, I might need that. Almost a max large shard upgrade, and then I'll just be going for chunks. Cool. Yeah. My question is, how did the Grooves get down here? I mean, I thought the Grooves were like mutated Farron servants, so how did they get down here? It's my big mood right now. Persistent. Follow me all the way out here, Jesus. So, what we're gonna do is I do not expect my chances of survival to be good, so I'm just gonna put on the Ring of Sacrifice. Just in case. Skirt. 
We out here, boys. Don't even need the Ring of Sacrifice. Let's go. Hmm. Oh, dancer left. What a shame. Right then, simple enough. This hammer's too good. Why is it so good? It shouldn't be, but it is.
proof that blacksmiths are the most powerful beings in the universe. Alright, off the map you go, I guess. One chunk. Um, I can give a black fire bomb to Snuggly. It's not Snuggly in this game. No, it's Picklebee Pumperum. Jeez. And I can get a chunk from that.
And there we go. Did I get the shield of want? I'm pretty sure I picked that up. Not that I'm going to use it. Yeah, I got it. Ooh, excuse me. Alright, this will be my last boss for today. That was just a terrible move on my part. I'm making some pretty shitty, like, rookie mistakes right now. Knock that shit off. Shit, I need to go back to um I need to go back to the chapel and give Ziegvard back his armor. Unless I already did that. I don't think I did though. I gotta do that. Yep, no. There we go.
Very good. I'm getting hungry. I'm gonna head for lunch soon. beat this man to death with a hammer. Very well. Three hundred forty one AR already. Wow. Okay then. Well, that's all for today. I need a break and some food. So I will see you guys next time I stream. Have a good day. Bye bye.